I wanted to talk a little bit about living with ME. Now, that's an illness. And I can't pronounce the long word because it's Latin, but it's in, you know, in the headlines. So, you know, oh, what is this living with ME about? You know, middle of the... Well, it's an illness I had it for 20 years, right? And some people say, what, what it's like, you know, what kind of illness is this and all that stuff. And most people don't know how it works and all that stuff. There's two problems with the illness. One, it's very, very hard to get a diagnosis because, one, you're exhausted, right? So if you go to the doctor and say, you know, I'm really tired, you know, all day long, I wake up in the morning, I'm really tired. And people go, the doctor will say, well, uh, you're going to run some blood samples and you can maybe do some x-ray also, you have some case work, you know. So the doctor run all those tests, finds nothing. Well, uh, here's the thing, we find nothing here at all today and it seems like it's nothing wrong with you. Well, I'm still tired. Now, if you've seen the TV show House, you know that uh, people will, may have symptoms and they think it's lupus or something else, and then they find out in the TV show that it's actually some rare. They've been to some, uh, in some mall, is, you know, whatever, right? But uh, in real life, this kind of ME uh, is kind of a shitty uh, illness. You have to learn to reorganize your life. So, for one thing, uh, statistically, one in four with this kind of illness uh, are basically in bed 24 7. Uh, they hardly even go to, you know, bathroom, visit, or something like uh, Of those one in four that are, you know, in bed 24 7, one of them, uh, a few of them, actually can't eat. Now you actually have to a tube into the stomach to get fed. Think about that, you know, you're too tired to eat even. Well, that means you, it's, more, it's, it's, it's less than being tired, it's most like being exhausted. Now, if you see firefighters who have been fighting a fire, for, for you know, they go into exhaustion because, you know, the heat, and the, the workload and all that stuff. So you can see them when, the, when they are in safety after, you know, fighting the fire. They basically fall asleep on the road. They put their head down and then they fall asleep because they're exhausted. Now, for a firefighter, they just go, oh, I'm gonna have some food. They'll be sleeping, have some food, boom, they're ready to go again. Some of it again, and me, for myself, for example, that's never happened. So when I go to bed exhausted, I wake up exhausted. It's no change. So that means that for me, since, you know, I had this for 20 years, I had to learn to you know, organize my life a little bit differently. One, one thing you do is to change your food. You know, you don't eat a lot of food. Uh, I can do that, but I, you know, tend to avoid it because it put, uh, you know, digestion takes energy. Cool. So that's one thing. You change your habits because uh, instead of taking the bus, because most people say, why would you take the bus instead of the train? Well, I wouldn't. I take the train because the train goes like this, very smooth. The bus go like this, and here's the thing: every time you have to correct your body, it requires energy. Now, for a normal human being, that's not even a problem. That's something you just do. Well, sitting on the bus, you know, jumping, scamping, no problem. Some of and me that causes a problem. It requires energy, so that's why I, you know. And I could be I'm pretty lucky here because we have a train that takes about 20 minutes to the big town, if I want to go to the big town, I can take the train because it's very smooth, you know, 20 minutes. I'll take the bus, that's like 20 to 40 minutes, depending on what kind of route you take, and, you know, the roads here are not good in that way. So that's a good thing. Now, I don't go shop during rush hour when there are a lot of families out there with, you know, a lot of noise. I don't go to restaurants. And I, you know, have a limited energy, as I like to say. And what do you do with that? Right. Uh, well, it depends. Uh, I have to choose very carefully. So if I work with golf instruction, I have to do that. I can't do a lot of other things. So, you know, I can't, uh, you know, uh, the symptoms for this kind of illness is kind of weird also. You have some brain fog. That means you're, you're kind of hard to think sometimes, hard to concentrate. Uh, recovery rate, if I do something physically, I, I had a walk this morning, it's been raining this night actually, so the walk was very, you know, slippery, 
so I didn't walk fast, I just took 50 minutes, right? That's my walk before breakfast, 50 minutes of walk. And people go, wow, 50 minutes, man. Whoa, are you really pushing it, man? Yeah, I actually am. I could have walked longer, obviously, but then I have to use a different tempo, a different pace. Then, you know, and I want to work, you know, so I have my aerobic capacity. Because most people think about, if you're an elite level endurance marathon runner and you put yourself to bed for a whole week, do nothing else, then just be in bed, do some bathroom, do some food, you lose about 10% of uh, your aerobic capacity and you lose some muscle, you know, degeneration. Your body and your brain adapt to the workload. So if you do nothing, which a lot of people now, mean, you know, then your body starts to go more efficient doing nothing. That means that, well, you don't need a lot of muscle suddenly. And you don't need a lot of, you know, cognitive ability either because you don't think a lot, you know. That's kind of a joke. So energy sustainment and things happen in the cell, obviously, we know that there is chemical, electrical signals in the cell and, you know, all this stuff. And, and here's the thing, uh, getting a diagnosis is difficult because you go through all those hoops, you know, because the doctors won't believe you at first, you know, it has to be something else. They can't really diagnose it with a blood sample. That means that the doctors, you know, you really have to convince the doctor to, you know, this is, you know, how it is. And because you can't really take a blood sample and just say, oh yeah, or an x-ray. Then um, problem number two is there is no fucking treatment. Yeah, okay, you got this. Well, I'll take some B vitamins, maybe some iron. I have to do that, really. Uh, because I mean, if I don't take that, it gets worse. So that's a factor that, you know, affecting my stuff. And it's, you know, ties into aerobic capacity for me. So what I did and been doing for 20 years is to reorganize my life. So I'm always relaxed. So when I do things, whatever, that might take a walk or talking to people in the camera like this and talking about what my fucking illness, I'm relaxed. I'm always relaxed. I'm relaxing 24 hours. I keep tabs on my blood pressure, you know, my physical status is the old times. And my doctor said, yeah, your blood pressure is really good, you know, perfect. And I said, yes, I know. You want me to lower it. For some reason, it always freaks the doctor out. You can lower your blood pressure? Yeah, of course. Can't you? No, they can't. But, you know, I learned to do that over here. So, when, and some people may say, so, how do you get this stuff? Is it contagious? No, no. What happens is that uh, 20 years ago, I had, um, I was up here and visiting family in France. And I got this cold, you know, normal influenza, you know. You get some fever, you get some nose, you know, you know, you have to go that you sneezing a little bit and like that. And you know, I had it before in some ways, you know, no problem, right? Then one morning I wake up and I can't fucking move. It's like, you know, you put a light switch out but and I was like, what the hell? And I couldn't even go back to where I had my office. I had a you know company all that stuff. I couldn't go back there because other people had to, you know, close it down for me because I couldn't go down there. It was horrible. And ever since then, I tried to get back to, you know, kind of... At the time, you know, before I got ill, I could run for five kilometers. Three to five kilometers. I wouldn't even break a sweat, basically. And today, I tried to jog 200 meters and my brain and body goes like this. Oh, no more. So I can jog 200 meters a day and I could run for five kilometers or even longer without you know, previously, 20 years ago, give or take. So it's kind of a, you know, shock for the system, if you like to. You know, I got shocked. And so you reorganize your life, uh, you learn, learn to deal with the energy levels, so that means that I have to plan everything. So if I work on growth strength, for example, I can't work on other things. If people are asking me to do something, I have to make sure I don't do a lot of uh, home gym or take a lot of walks, because recovery rates go to shit with this. So if I take a walk, I do some homium, I may have three or four or five days of recovery. So I have to, you know, keep tabs on that. So when I, I run, I generate to May for about five months, I try to build up some physical status because I know that's important. And it's easier in the spring also, you know. We live in the, where I live, you know, light comes up, you know, spring, snow goes away and stuff like that. So I then build over this over a few months. So it's, you know, you have to, you know, <laughs> keep the pace up. Now, and you also have to learn to deal with people who do not understand this kind of stuff. They don't understand what it means to be exhausted all the time because 
maybe you are sometimes, but then you just go recover and go, oh, good to go now. That never happens. So, when I got ill 20 years ago, I felt like in my lymph node, for example, it was like, you know, putting in a knife there. I remember I was going, uh, walking as a caddy for almost many years ago that I had such a pain in my legs and in one thigh, I couldn't take a step without, you know, it's like a knife, you know, going through the leg. So I had to learn to deal with that while I was, you know, do, you know doing caddy work. So some things, you know, you have to learn to deal with, um, and I'm pretty well equipped for it because, you know, I do this kind of work with, with other people, you know. Sh change for uh, how the mind works, you know, I did uh, done a lot of body work, something like that. So I'm able to deal with um, what we would call a quality of life situation. Then you have, you know, people that you have to deal with which are uh, what we call assholes, right? So, uh, <clears throat> I did a vlog here about Luke Donald. Luke Donald, you know, we did, we did work with the, uh, golf. Or, and I'm building golf instruction that existed before. There is nothing like this in the world. And I have to build new models and new understanding for it, so. And it works, right? <clears throat> so I made a vlog about Luke Donald. Here's the thing what happened to him. The evidence is stacked against him. He wanted to hit longer. He went to shock cock, right? And uh, since Chuck Cook, you know, made him lose his game, then this guy called Charles Rogers Golf. Probably maybe a golf instructor. I don't know. I give a fuck about that. Uh, so, he's, you know, saying that the players have got bad and the type of courses the player now made for the Bombers. Yeah, that's why Luke Donner wanted to change his swing. So this guy, Charles Jordan, comes in and make a commentary. He's an asshole, right? Uh, he's the one that's acting stupid there, and he's just telling me, and he's excusing Luke Donald. So all this evidence is stacked against Luke Donald. So Charles Jordan's golf comes in and writes something on my channel, and I'm like, well, this is one of the people in golf that excusing that Luke Donald got, well, back problems and lost his game and swing and distance and all this stuff. And then he's trying to excuse it, and I'm like, why would you even do that? Boy, you created a family and, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's a very decent guy, you know, a motivation and, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Right. So all this evidence is stacked against Luke Donald, right? Could it look Donald have motivational problems? Well, if you can't hit it long, and you, you, know, and you try to go and change your swing, and it's into you 2015, it's gonna get back. So this guy, Charles Rogers Golf, has absolutely no fucking clue what the fucking ever what he talks about. This is one of those stupid golf instructors in the world that you that teaches you to struggle with golf. Now I have zero patience with assholes and ignorant people. You know, people who are acting stupid, especially when they come right to my channel. So, this George Rogers golf here is, you know, one of those people you have to learn to deal with. So, I wrote a comment that he, is, you know, he lives in denial and, you know, and he doesn't realize that. And he may write another comment and if he does, I'm going to ban him. Because this is what you do, this is what technology allows you to do is, you have to learn, when you're living with me, you have to learn to ignore all these kind of stupid people in that regard. Well, they're acting stupid, they're not stupid really. They're just ignorant and then they, you know, acting stupid. That's how it works. Right? There's a difference there. People say, well, you're such an idiot. Well, you can be, but usually it means that they have a behavior. You know, they're acting, saying things, believing things, and assume things that, you know, make them act really stupid for a lot of people who know stuff. You know, like myself. And when I hear this kind of excuses people make for other people, and I'm like, you know, since I work with evidence, so I have all this evidence with, with Luke Donald that I presented, and he chose to ignore all that. And then, you know, put on some excuses. That means he didn't deal with the material I was talking about. When you have this kind of people who live in denial, like this George Rogers Golf is doing here on my channel, 
that's what you, this is the people who teach you golf, they make you struggle. When you struggle, so I have a nice student, right? He went through 12 teachers and five years of golf, and every time he went and played, he went to shit. He went back to the instructor like Charles Rogers Golf and asked them, you know, my golf, my game, you suck. What's going on? And they couldn't answer. They didn't know. And for me, that's like a doctor today. You know, go to the doctor, you know, I'm exhausted all the time. And the doctor goes, well, I don't know. I can't do anything about it. And the doctor are trained to not do that. It's kind of funny sometimes, you know, when you see people behave like that. And, well, uh, I'm going to run some tests. And, well, I had this for 20 years. What do you think going to happen when the previous doctor, you know, did all these things and they have been to all these departments, all that stuff. And the doctor will go, well, uh, because he's so trained, it's like a monkey in that regard, to do things. I have to be able to, you know, of course you're going to find something that's, you know, what you have and we, we can treat it. That's how they train. What do you think is going to happen when they meet someone well, with such an illness? You can't do anything. Well, the same thing as everybody else in any other field. They don't know. And sometimes people make up shit that has no bearing. So this George Rogers Golf, for example, doesn't meet my, you know, I make a, lot, a long list when I talk about Luke Donald, what's going on with him. I present some evidence, you know, along the way. And all this evidence, he doesn't answer. He, he chooses to ignore all this evidence. George Rogers Golf. So this is a sh what I call an asshole, a shithead. You know, and I don't deal with that, other than, you know, making a point in this video. That you have to learn to deal with uh, how you make decisions when you have this kind of illness. You have to be really keen on what's important for you. We talk about quality of life. So if I have, for example, an hour of my day that I feel, you know, I can do something. That hour of day I do something that's important for me, that, you know, quality of life stuff. I don't uh, do things that, you know, or, you know, I have to choose between uh, doing one thing and another thing, and we're always going to do that gives me better quality of life. And the other one, I just, you know, doesn't do. Most people would do all of them, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and then, you know. And I, I live in a small apartment, but cleaning for me, that means, okay, I'm going to, I have to break it down in three steps, you know, I take the living room, the next day I take the bathroom, and the third day I take, you know, up some other things. And most people go, wow, it's, why don't you do everything at once? Oh, that's what life is for me, because most people won't understand that, because you can't relate to it. That's a work. And the doctor can't relate either, because they will, oh, well, uh, seems kind of weird that you have, uh, let's take some blood sample and examine if you have asthma, for example, or... No, I don't. And since you're sent to all these kind of uh, places, I was sent to psychiatric, you know. And I remember I was, you know, sitting down with this uh, guy and he looked at me, well, you're not depressed, he said. No, of course not. And uh, that was that. Yeah, he was, you know, and he, this was a funny thing, he was telling, because I was telling him about my illness and all this stuff. And he had a colleague who runs research down south in Sweden. There is a research center for ME in Sweden. But getting, sending people there is very difficult because it costs a lot of money. Right? But this, uh, he said, you know, he's going to try to find a way to if he can send me there. But he, he didn't at the end because, you know, I guess it's politics in the, you know, medical science and stuff like that. Well, we don't want to pay for that, so we have to you know, put it on someone else's table. <coughs> and so on. So you're gonna, if you have this kind of illness and you don't know what it is, first and foremost, uh, the doctors won't believe you. You actually have to prove to them and convince them. And uh, that takes a lot of time. It took me, <coughs> sorry, it took me uh, 13 years <coughs> to get the doctor to, you know, sign the paper that, you know, they couldn't do anything. It took me 13 years. I tried to get back, you know, I don't want to sit at home, you know, write some, some stuff and all this stuff and, you know, no, oh, yeah, okay, done for the day. I have nothing else to do today because the rest of the day I have to rest. Two couple of days ago I couldn't sit in front of the computer, I have to go, you know, 
I watch on TV, I slept in the sofa, I watch on TV, I slept in the sofa, basically, and all that. So this is kind of a, you know, uh, so whenever people complain, you know, whine or something, I'm just ignore it because it's just people that have no idea what they're talking about because they don't uh, deal with evidence. I mean, when I have people who doesn't deal with evidence and, you know, deny that, I just, you know, put the butt, put my finger on the button, you know, delete them and, you know, remove them. That's what you have to learn to do. So your decision making has to be quality of life. Make sure you don't do a lot of things. You just do those things that are important for you, quality of life. And when you have to deal with people who are, uh, you know, ignorant in some ways, acting stupid in other ways, you have to learn to just ignore them fully. Because they're going to be there, you know. People are always going to tell you that, you know, yeah, it's a, you know, you imagine things, you know, it's a placebo, you know, all that other stuff and all that stuff. Because they can't understand. And what I've been doing with golf, for example, makes people hit longer and never struggle. So this guy who went to someone like Charles Rogers Golf, for example, he was struggle for life. But with me, he won't struggle because he doesn't need lessons anymore. But uh, Charles Rogers Golf, for example, will, will ignore and deny that he doesn't teach people to struggle. Yes, they, yes, he does. And I assume he is a guy because his name is Charles. Because, you know, golf is internet and such. Uh, very rarely people actually post their own names. I don't know why. I always post with my name. Why won't you? Well, I don't want to have people uh, telling me I'm saying stupid things. Especially when you do that. Right. So, and me is a kind of weird illness. There is no, no, no treatment, no cure, or something like that, as far as I know. They re do research, of course. Uh, there is very, very difficult to get the doctor to diagnose it because you have to go to all those departments. Every, you have to go to everything. I have done that multiple times until they got to the point that I, well, we don't see you because you are fully examine according to our, you know, criteria on our department, and I go, oh, okay. That's why it takes a long time to get the diagnosis, because, you know, and you're tired, right? So you, you have to deal with the people coming and tell, well, you have to do this. No, you don't. I say, I don't. Well, it's very important for me. They say, well, maybe important for you, but I give a fucking rat's ass about it. This is why I don't do online golf lessons. Uh, and people may not understand why, because it, it's a lot of energy, you know, because if I'm going to fix people's swing, I have to actually teach them how to build a new swing. I don't fix problems. I was watching Jacob Baldwin, he's a Mike Austin uh, golf swing, and he was having an early extension in his swing. He posted a swing on uh, Facebook yesterday. He's playing in Portugal. Nice place. Warm, nice place. I would love to be there also, still in this fucking weather we have. And I was, he was sending an eight turn and he was hitting and he was doing all the extension. I was thinking to myself, that he shouldn't do. And the problem for Jacob Bonner, he doesn't know how to fix that either, you know, which is kind of funny. Just, you know, something I <coughs> noticed yesterday. So, you know, I don't have a lot of pain in my body. I have to be careful with my food and stuff like that. And I still have pain, especially my... Uh, uh, so I have to change my diet and stuff like that. I eat less food nowadays than, than previously and so on and so on and so on. I don't, you know, smoke. I don't, you know, do drugs. Which would... I think they would, would be helping taking drugs, I guess, for a while. Until you, you know, not on drugs anymore, then you need more drugs. That's kind of a bad thing, I guess. I think Richard Bannon can tell you about that stuff. So. You know, when you're a drug habit. Um, so, I drink some coffee, some tea. I don't drink, you know, normally. So, this is things that, you know, because everything you do matters. You know, most people, you know, you have, most people have this range of uh, things you can do, right? You can do some jobs, you can do some work during the day, you can take care, uh, uh, do some. Uh, free time stuff and you have this you know all day plan out and you can do that because you have extra amount of you know things you can do but some of them me they have like this so if I do this thing here then I have a little bit less energy to do things the rest of the day 
So if I do a couple more things, you know, I get to the level of, okay, I don't want to do more things because now <clears throat> I'm, you know, going to affect my, you know, well-being and status of my, you know. So then, you you know, I'm very, very careful with those kind of stuff nowadays because if I go over the edge, as I like to say, it could be a problem for seven days. So last year, in the spring, I, uh, summer, I had like four months that I was really out of it. And that's not fun. So I'm, I'm trying to be careful, but it can happen anyway because, you know, this, you know, if, if you, especially during the summer, you know, it's nice weather outside, I'm more outside then because, you know, it's more nicely place to be outside when it's summer. And that put a lot more strain on me, so sometimes I can go over the edge then, and that's, you know, not a good thing, but it can happen. And then I have to spend some time to get back to you know, quality of life situation again, some well-being. So anyway, um, if you were listening and watching this and see through all this stuff, good for you. Um, because it, a lot of people don't understand how you can be exhausted all the time because you never are. Because for you it's temporary. Someone near me is most likely gonna be for a fucking order. Some improve, some get worse, some get, you know, evil. And uh, the, the problem obviously is that people don't know. The doctors does know, there is no treatment. Some do research and, you know, some things work for some people and some other things doesn't work for other people and they don't know why. And that's all, you know, come a problem in golf. So you can teach someone one thing and then you teach someone else the same thing and they can't do it. And then you don't know why. Especially when you go ask George Golf about that, he can't answer you why. But I can. So I've become kind of an expert on uh, ME because, you know, I study myself. And you have to deal with, uh, you know, things that people generally never have to deal with because, you know, it, it's just temporary for them. But uh, that's how it is, you know. I'm still alive. I don't, uh, you know, I'm not in bed 24-7, which is horrible. Because last week in Sweden, three people with me killed themselves. Because they saw no way out. They had no option to, because there is no treatment, right? And uh, I was reading one of them was in a wheelchair. He had, his fingers were swollen. You know, he had, you know, a lot of shit going on. And, you know, it's, there is no life quality. And they get to the point where they, you know, feel like, you know, this is no way of living in your life. So you just kill themselves. I can understand why. There, you know, when you're really, really tired like this, as I've been sometimes, it's not fun. You know, you're exhausted and it never goes away. So, ooh, yeah. But here's the thing. Uh, if you get, learn to track your body, you know, as I said previously, that I keep tabs on my body, my brain, and how, what kind of, uh, you know, workload I can do. So, and I'm just test that limits I have. So nowadays I know I can go walk for 50 minutes. That's pretty much the limit I have, and I can test the pace. And if I go too fast, I recognize the signals, and you know, oh, okay, I can't go. That's too fast for me. So I have to, you know, back off a little bit. So, but I can do that because I've learned to do that over years to track this stuff. You know, normal people that doesn't have this kind of skill set I have, uh, well, they're probably going to exhaust themselves too fast. Because you don't, you know, at first you may not feel, like, oh, I'm feeling pretty good, and then you because you overdo it. And most people don't have that kind of sensitivity or taps on your body and, you know, brain and stuff like that. But I do. So, yeah, it's a shitty illness, um, and I realized many years ago that doctors have no clue what the hell they're doing about this because, you know, they have a really hard time to understand what's going on, and they have the tendency that they, they, they're so trained in the medical models that all of you diagnosed, and you make a treatment, and then you, you know, and when they can't do that, they, they kind of stop, you know, like, oh, what, sh what should I do with this patient because I don't know what to do now here, I'm sorry, I have to do something. I'm like, no, you don't, actually. It's, it's, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. That's why, you know, when I'm working on golf instruction, it takes a fucking long time because I know what to teach, and I'm developing an instruction here based on the students or the testers' reaction and stuff like that. So I make a video for them, send the video. They look at the video, they do the video, 
and follow that instruction and then I can do this in the same video and see how they do that. If they not do what I want them to do, I have to make a new video. And that goes on for a while until it, you know, get it right. That's how you develop new instruction, by the way. So it works. And uh, one tester, you know, had over 100 yards loss here. He went from 200 yards to 300 yards. And he hits longer than more across it. And probably longer than just or just golf also. Can teach you. You want to listen to clueless golf instructors? The gurus out there in the world? Go ahead. I don't stop you. But <clears throat> I have so many people, you know, saying to me that, well, they are kind of retarded out there in golf. They teach you, me and others to struggle. Yes, I know. I don't do that. I teach people to make, uh, you know, quality of life, well-being, functional stuff. And uh, usually people resist that because, you know, they want to, I want to feel depressed. I want to be acting stupid. I want to be an asshole and stuff like that, you know. They continue to want to be that. I think that's weird. Don't you? And now, thanks. I'm going to go and make some coffee and some breakfast now and the rest of it. This is what it's like, you know, you make this video, once I'm done with that, I go back into very, very deep relaxation, because that's what I have to do. Have a good time. Yeah?